How amazing. Um, I reckon that question, that's really to do with the uh, age of the earth. I think it's a really good one. Um, I mean, right off the cuff, it's just something interesting, isn't it? Um, could anybody just talk a bit about it? Because shouldn't it be something which we really you know a little bit about? Of course, um, a lot of people could say, like science, for instance, is uh, always, well, that you know, well, you know, we, we've used the scientific process and uh, we've determined that the Earth is uh, about 4.5 billion years old and then they'll tell you how old the universe is in relation to what this is and this sort of thing. And these are very deep extrapolations, of course, because um, in um, qualitative research, you have to be able to have a, 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 a referential index or an observational reference point when you're making some comparator. <clears throat> and if, you don't, if you're not there beforehand to see what the ingredients went into a mix of something, how would you know that um, the ingredients didn't get put in in a different way and something came in and um, changed the uh, formula around? I mean, how would you know that, you see? Because you'd have to actually uh, have an assumption that something existed beforehand. And um, this is a bit of a problem where people are where they've gone to date the Earth. But um, let's think about it a little bit because you could think that um, um, it's the uh, oceans really at the bottom is only about 85,000 years old. Mm. And, uh, you know, um, that's pretty much confirmed a lot by uh, carbon-14 looking at all sludge bits of patterns and things like that from the bottom of these uh, oceans and where the oldest bits are. Um, and so, you know, it makes sense when you start to think about things more this way because you can find soft blood and uh, tissue and uh, uh, soft tissue and things in T-Rex bone and these are kinds of things which people might have not ever thought a bit about before. But And now you can do those sorts of things and you can see that there's no way that uh, these dinosaurs and this sort of thing could have um, be so far away. But interestingly, if I just say, you know, how many stars are in the universe, it's going to put you into a trans derivational search for information for sure. Like it's just going to leave you in a trance. And if somebody just says, oh yeah, like, well, you know, it's eight point, it's 4.5 billion years old, that's how old the Earth is, what are you going to do after that? It's like, we just give up and think, <laughs> well, what's it, what's it going to be for us just to know a tiny bit about the past? It's like, whoa. Now, why not know the whole thing and not be so, like, you know, uh, 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 putting a lot of information out, which could be not so quite right, of course. Um, you know, because at 8,000, um, you know, uh, four, uh, you know, 490 BC, you've got uh, an asteroid which comes in and buries itself into the Atlantic. And, um, and uh, you know, <clears throat> you've got... Uh, things that goes on at 144,000 miles per hour even are huge um, and you've got asteroids which get smashed just into the Atlantic for instance like for instance where the Cape Charles uh, Virginia is um, and evidence of course shows where that did smash in um, and it's a reason where dots or could be lined up more where um, you could see yourself uh, where a false paradigm might have been um, and then suddenly you could see that how you know a sonar could be used and that's revealing a landscape um, that sunk because of it uh, in Atlantis all around um, you know, some islands and things which is left there still but um, um, right below uh, on the landscape there you could see gorgeous uh, beautiful landscape just like uh, it was a dry land at one point um, and um, you've got 70% of the ocean which covers all over the globe at the moment and most of that water wasn't there before um, and a lot more water has sort of come along and where did this come from and uh, we could talk just a bit about this maybe tonight or you know in this program a little bit um, that you're listening to um, And um, but asteroid evidence where why shouldn't it be that anybody would actually consider those sorts of things because you've got really big huge impacts that grow on and of course the Greenland one um, and do you know about these things because the evidence of sort of some great um, you know uh, like a terrestrial uh, calamitous type of event um, you've got at least 200 or more that have been um, looked at and seen and they're massive you know they're not minor um, <laughs> um, and when, get, when one of those goes off what goes on for us and what goes on where the earth is it really does boil it inside and it takes a long time for that to stop boiling 
<clears throat> and um, it could have been thousands of years ago and it's still sort of really boiling a lot inside from that. <clears throat> and we're going to talk a bit about that boiling in a second. But <clears throat> when you don't think that there's anything really responsible um, or for the earth where it is, it's definitely grown 12 times larger than it was because when you fit all the continents together, they fit exactly perfect together. But a day in Saturn, of course, which the earth used to belong to Saturn, and when Saturn came in um, between Jupiter, which um, Jupiter was only um, about 1.5, I think, uh, astronomic units away from the sun at the point, um, um, Saturn came in and... Um, and um, the Earth used to be part of Saturn com 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 complex, um, and uh, it left it there in the same um, tilt as angle as it used to have. Um, and uh, so we could talk a bit about that because it's like on a, on a different sort of an angle um, than what the Sun's plane is, but it's pretty much on a similar angle, just a bit more or less, with a bit of a, a slight, slight not um, the same as it would have been where it was where Saturn was. And so it got tracked into space where it was. And as Saturn came out, um, came back out again, it pulled uh, Jupiter back out with it. I mean, Jupiter comes out to be 5.3, I think, uh, astron uh, uh, astronomical units, which is a unit of measurement. That's one of those is the measurement that the Earth is away from the Sun. So, an astro so it's 5.3 of those astronomical units more. And it pulled the Jupiter out to where it is. Um, and then um, Venus was one of the planets that also um, was let loose a bit during that period of time. Took a bit of a time, but it smacked into um, you know, um, Jupiter, which you can see the hole where that is um, on Jupiter, and then wandered around. Um, and then you could talk a little bit about when it finally got into place, um, um, where, where Venus finally gets back into place. But before it does, of course, um, Mars has wandered around a bit as well, and it's come really, really close to the Earth, which perhaps are those things which we could talk a little bit about perhaps because um, Sedona um, and those sorts of things could easily be seen with a telescope um, back in the day where this, this was and went on, which is fairly not too long ago actually, you see. Um, everything is really much more younger than most people think um, and when you put it into terms like this. Um, but we're going to talk what would be the reason why suddenly you could all go, you could actually think about things because you could really look at the earth bottom and start to read everything a little bit more and put it all together a little bit. But a day on Saturn is 10.7 hours, of course, um, and it takes 29.4 Earth years um, for one for one year to, for Saturn to move around the sun. Oh, I heard of that. And it takes 10,756 Earth days to make one year sort of on Saturn. And so the last time Saturn sort of really was close to the Earth was, um, will be is 2034, of course. And the dance between the Neptune and Saturn always would go on. But um, look, I'm t letting you know that there's such a massive difference, in fact, actually, in how close um, these planets can come toward us and how far out they ever move as well. I mean, you've got sorts of things that's going on that sort of um, affects this um, and can can make it vary quite a bit. I mean, so it's not necessary that something in a moment of time could, could be uh, um, in the same uh, uh, orbit, more or less, relative. But um, it's a 26.7 degree angle where the, where the plane is in its orbit um, for, uh, you know, uh, Saturn in its relationship to the Sun's um, equatorial plane. Um, and it's the same rate, more or less, as Neptune also, which is also a water, watery body like Earth, relative, um, and some of the moons and things that are there, like uh, around Jupiter. Um, but these, the Saturn rings, which you could see really as a tilt, is a product more of an ancient set of planets that was missing, um, and you can see sort of a ring that's left from what's going on there. But it's very similar to Earth's 23.5 degree tilt, in fact, and what the reason is that most everything is relative to the equatorial plane of the sun, yet we've got just a couple of things that isn't, like the Earth, and the Earth's degree tilt, you know, wobbles a bit, but it's around about 23.5 sort of on an angle, you see, so similar. Um, and so could you not say that something was on an actual uh, Saturn influence to ever cause what this is? But um, these are things which I've written a little bit about more um, and somebody could go to. I'm not sure where that is, on Facebook or something, I don't know. But um, it's a shredded moon um, 
fact where a chrysalis is, which has occurred, I mean, could you say that that happened 160,000 years ago, just a short time ago? Really? Yes, it did. You see, we're talking about the rings of Saturn, and when that, when this all sort of gets, uh, uh, moons where things like get um, moved together more and, uh, um, and, and something is missing there quite a bit. But Saturn really um, is very similar um, in its manner of things. Of course, it's much a watery body there. Um, but we've got characteristics and things which is interesting. And wouldn't you say that um, some of these things are because we actually belong to Saturn in a time gone by. But um, belonging to the Saturn um, constellation, which then eventually gets captured by the Sun and gets deposited where Saturn really, like we're talking about, comes in front of Jupiter in the past. And um, as it comes back out, it just leaves the Earth in the similar inclination that um, that was. Um, well, people could talk a bit about the Comet of Doom where Atlantis is, the source, of course. And Atlantis slowly gets sunk. Um, and then the first king of Atlantis, um, which King Jabba is and Cleopatra are uh, connected to, of course. And all the lands quite a bit that were Moor and Kush um, and um, a lot of all us really solidly connected all the nations of the Earth um, was, was a... Uh, a minor um, majority. Um, but the common of doom in Atlantis, if you look at the seaboard seamount um, that's found rooted more on a large terrace sort of plateau, you know, southeast of the Azores plateau under the water, and you can find coral, and it's gonna help. It's like several hundred meters down. Um, a coral can only grow into 20 to 30 meters, and then suddenly you can find coral that, that is way down there, even a thousand meters or more. On um, that's 3,000 feet, and so, or more than that. I mean, so you've got an old epic, 600 BC, of course, which talks about Atla, um, and it's certain it said that, um, that um, it really wasn't a dream, and not and that um, these were people that used to not have anything to eat except plant and they never ate anything that would you know, try to struggle and get away from you. And they were fairly fair skinned um, and boats and this sort of thing. Um, and 66,000 years ago, of course, you've got the coast of Guinea off West Africa. You've got a similar type of event like Chicksimmer Club but is it actually millions of years old or is it really only 66,000 years ago, you see? Because we could talk just a bit about the actual age because obviously um, radiometric dating is out and it's completely off. I mean, how can you use that, basically? You could within a certain degree, but certainly not with rocks and certainly not trying to date where the Earth is. But the crustaceous uh, paleolithic extinction that went on um, if we go back 12,900 years, it's really a short time, um, you're going to see a sort of what's called the Younger Dyer era happen, and it's sort of like a mini ice age. Um, where, and it's like you've got a Younger Dyer era, and over the atmosphere of um, looking at the, what the climate goes on, and then all of a sudden that gets broken, and it only lasts for a few thousand years or less. But um, after that, like 10,000 years ago, the property gets broken, of course. Um, and this, this coincides with 10,000 years ago with Atlantis sort of being sunk. Um, and um, that asteroid that we started to talk a bit about. Um, and was it that not allowed um, ongoing, which you know, you're seeing various things occur. The last asteroid, of course, is the Burkle Crater. And that Burkle Crater... Um, had, of course, a massive tsunami. We could talk a bit about the Burkle Crater because that's in the southern Indian Ocean. And that wiped out all of North Africa because it came, pushed a big, huge wind, a wall of water up there. And rather than going more north, it was all channeled by all the mountains, the Crest Mountains, which just channeled it all from the land and just dropped it back onto the Sahara and the... the uh, um, the Mediterranean and sucked all the water out of the Mediterranean when that happened and then it rushed back in again, which we have a bit of a story about in the path of all the bones. But um, the Burkle Crater um, caused a massive tsunami um, and that wiped out the whole of North Africa 
living it as it is today. Um, and um, that was like 4,800 years ago. And that also equates exactly with Noah's flood, of course. People talk a bit about that. But did the old equator really exist before 12,900 years ago, a little bit 2,000 years before this, when the younger, drier era got kicked off? Yes, it did. Matter of fact, the Chilean plateau and the Aztec lines all show and show proof that the old equator really where that went. And there's other shows and things that we've done that actually talk a little bit about how even Giza was right on the um, old equator line. And if you know this, you can know that that was time zero. And now you can learn a lot of things. You could learn what degrees and angles and things were and where uh, are lots of, um, um, uh, you know, where you could find various things. Um, and that's, you know, interesting because you could learn how to find where things were. But because um, it was all based on a uh, central sort of uh, uh, cartography. But 12,800 years ago, really, you got a deep chill. And then suddenly all of them eight degrees colder in nature, and um, you've got uh, a hundred, uh, you know, one th- a th- like a thousand two hundred years after this, you've got as the sea all snapping uh, dramatically back out of all of this, and the data um, shows you know that ice stag- stag- stalactites and um, uh, stagmites sort of um, in caves, and then ice cores and things shows that there was a massive, massive burn off during that period of time. Most all the trees that was existed got burned and that was like 12,000 sort of 500 years ago basically. So a big spike there was, yes, you could see it and it was 12,000 some 800 years ago relative um, that you've got um, this huge uh, explosion that goes on above the uh, Hudson and so like an atmospheric sort of explosion um, and it tilts the earth uh, and uh, causes like trees to all get knocked down and all get flooded and things uh, down the Mississippi and this happens like a few times you see and it gets buried all down there and you can see sink of cypress sort of trees um, all still in the mud which are over 10,000 years old down in Louisiana but the um, Earth was always part of Saturn, and the Saturn rings really are much younger, of course, than the Earth, um, and that they formed really in the time of dinosaurs, um, and that was only more recent, not in millions of years, and it's symbiotically more arrived, so that sharks, for instance, are much older than trees, of course, and dinosaurs and sharks all have been here for a bit longer and this sort of thing. Um, but, but everything that sort of really been said is totally incorrect and there's no nothing sort of joining anything together like as if there was a, a, a lizard and then all of a sudden you, know, you have humans or something and that's just completely wrong Darwinism is completely off and there is an involuted state but not an evoluted state but at some point we could talk a bit about that but we could stick with a little bit of this sort of dating and so on a bit but um, the earth really didn't evolve more from a perpetual um, dawn, which it did, um, and uh, so you've got to look into this. In fact, there was some point which we definitely do know there was no seasons, and that was when we were connected to to um, um, Saturn. But once we got connected where we were, we suddenly are on a different plane to the uh, um, the sun left there, um, and continuing to have a season a little like we would if we were on on um, Saturn where things are now um, but um, so if, if the Earth was really back in the day had a perpetual dawn it really didn't have a day or a night but it had more an ultraviolet sky and so the light that came to us was a bit more dark and so it's still to this day the Saturn is called the dark sun and the sun took more Earth um, as a form of satellite and kept it sort of with itself as Saturn sort of went back out and it pulled Jupiter back out. And so basically um, we came from in front of Jupiter, um, which Saturn did, and as it went back out it pulled Jupiter back with it and left Earth, of course, one astronomical unit from the Sun and pulled Jupiter out to 5.3 astronomical units and it deposited the Earth and left it sort of. And so the black sun really wasn't any more. And that's a story which, which Cloud and the Toltec talk about. 
as far as this being the fifth son that she um, and the elders had documented. I mean, they had writing, which was all on a string, and that a lot of us would think, oh, well, these people, they were pretty dumb, got all because they had a hell of a lot more wisdom and knowledge. They passed on than what most people could have on the internet or anything that they could find today. And so you're looking at a golden age which we're moving into um, and the beginning of some strange attractor which causes us to all cause, be drawn more to change. Um, and um, But Saturn really formed more in this primordial sort of nebula um, which sort of, sort of forms the sun and planetary systems and Uranus and Venus sort of both rotate sort of in opposite directions to the regular spin and it explains actually what happened where both of those planets get knocked around so that they're actually spinning in the opposite direction that which everything else is spinning from east to from west to east but that spins from east to west and you've got celestial sort of bodies okay. which is Venus and Uranus which really experiencing very large collisions which which caused to spin um, and now in the opposite direction of course but a present condition really is arrived at here where the sun and the same is of the past um, as we pass through various positive bits of space but never the same quite proper um, as we're moving around al -Qayon. and it takes like near 26,000 years to sort of do one evolution. But Jupiter sort of formed more in a 3.5 AU um, um, area and then went inward to 1.5 AU um, and then reversed course more um, during the time where it gets captured by Saturn and pulled back out. Saturn's a very, very, very positive body. Um, it pulls Jupiter out and it crosses over the asteroid belt twice and it scatters them so unbelievable inward and outward um, and then of course August of 2003 you could imagine that you're looking at how close um, you know, everything is and um, you've got only 3.48 uh, million miles away you see um, you've got um, Saturn um, and um, maybe only in 70,000 70, years ago um, Venus got more an atmosphere blown off and so um, things are really could be put more in terms of an age and time frame a little more that gives people a greater capacity to actually really truthfully sort of get an idea of how Venus was, was ejected and pushed out and away from Jupiter and around 1500 BC you see a periodic passage which is causing havoc noted which, which Mars goes on with this goes on as well like we talked about in this story. Um, these things are reported and existing in all the literature on written places and far away or pointing to something that could be obvious that something happened. But Venus was really deposited more inside of um, Jupiter and by Saturn and Jupiter ejecting um, Saturn um, it gets everything pulled out and leaves Earth where it exists now in the inclination that it has in Earth's orbit of course in an axial inclination um, and around 800 um, to 700 BC of course you, you really got stories of and the Sedona complex being set up which is only a really short time ago of course where Mars was so close to Earth in its wanderedness during that time frame that, um, that Venus was trying to get into order a little bit you see uh, okay. But um, if you don't trust uh, the story where uh, the Bible is, for instance, how could anybody go on to talk about the salvatedness of all things either, um, where a story could be just so off maybe, or closer to my story, which is in the science, it's really off. But a J.C. Quanta, which is really the, uh, 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 how did the earth grow, and you've got a J.C. Quanta of, of, of water as an equilibrium, and it's a J.C. Quanta, for instance, has got a lot of anomalies um, where blood, um, for instance, can only be at 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit to be able to actually hold on to its potassium, otherwise it actually start to ever lose its potassium. And that activity really requires some sort of change in temperature as a cell membrane. Um, and, a, and a J.C. Quanta really critically um, manages things where such is like this. It's sort of really something which causes liquid as a set colloid 
to have sort of five phases, like a solid, a gel, a liquid, a gas, and a, a magneton ether. And these are sort of um, states of a colloid. And so below hydrogen, you've got ions, of course. And so hydrogen is the really smallest element, of course, as JC quanta is going to infinity. But in equilibrium or of magneton exchange, really is a management where there's a functional plasticity far more for water to be able to take on the shape and things and characteristics to be able to act, function for memory and things like that. And so when I was to 1.4 nanometers per fre a frequency like 1.4 hertz, which, which will, the water also suddenly cleans itself. So a, a fish that's put into a little bit of life hydrate water um, could they be released in a stream and it will clean the whole stream. A small amount of this water will um, cause the resonance of itself. It's the finest memory of the Earth um, and in the universe, which is of hydrogen. Um, and it's 1.432 hertz, which is pure life hydrate water. And it's like really got a lot more hydrogen. It's got three hydrogen molecules to one oxygen molecule that's positive. And, and then it's equally balanced with an oxygen and hydrogen um, north negative, you see. So to be equal, you've got an ordinization, which is a real resonant JC quanta. And at a constant, really, like if you take a temperature like 25 degrees Celsius, for instance, which you've got pure water, um, I could give you an equation, which is a JC quantum equilibrium reaction. But in some book and something which people could be, be interested, we could talk a bit more about that. But basically, really, like what you've got hydrogen, more like this hydronium ions, which is gold hydride, um, just like gold hydride, um, and the oxygen. Um, and you've got really a north negative charge, a magneton. You've got a capacity where water is really to be able to um, be able to um, cause a greater, uh, softer, a membrane and um, of course more permeability of nutrient into the cell and things just like this and proper cell function because otherwise it sort of really could be um, dried up a lot more and um, you've got um, 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 bitterness and sort of itchy skin and dry sort of psoriasis types of conditions which is absolutely exacerbated by hypercapnia which is really like mouth breathing rather than nose breathing through sleep which you really should pay attention to these sorts of things but it's a really provided protection against free radicals of course um, and on job cell rejuvenation um, you've really got um, life hydrate coming in which which assists to cause all the blood platelets and things to be more unstuck otherwise you've got a kilowatt um, a JC quanta of a kilowatt which is an equilibrium constant more for water um, and where it has a, a, a measurement and it's got a high kilowatt, it has a greater power, it has greater, a greater neededness to be able to have to have operated that as well. And so a hell of a lot more energy really is used um, in a thousand watt um, than it is like um, you know, a point 0.1 or something. But so it's like a kilowatt of hour of work um, and uh, something which which is functional, where water is can be structured, it can have a power within it to get work done, and it acts and it's acting as an antioxidant, and it's the smallest smallest antioxidant in the world. And now most antioxidants are huge. It's like a Queen Mary carrying something along, which it will give to something, but how where can that go through anything? No, where this life hydrate does, it goes through everything. You see. I mean, so it's probably one of the most, it's the most powerful sort of antioxidant and things that's in the world. Um, if we go back and we look just at the question, of course, about the oceans and sort of the rocks are really crying out to everybody. You've got in the Cretaceous era and the, and, um, in the Meso era, um, you saw like a, a, pal a paleogenic uh, extinction goes on. And the crystals that's within ourselves where the dawn it's drawn more, it's really an alignment more to the Earth's magnetic field. And just like a compass needle, really, it lines up with the north negative pole. Everybody could really see um, where the rotation was, where the poles were in the past, of course, where the magnetic pole shifts were <clears throat> in the showing the ages of time and orientation on the sea floor where the magnetic magma got set and how long and big a time that it took for those expansion joints to grow. I mean, those are things that you could really understand actually how the Earth has come to be where it is um, and, the, and the, the, the continents in relation to each other. But basically that really only goes back 85,000 years ago when the, when the oceans start to, to grow 
And so you're only really looking at brand new oceans. It's only about 85,000 years old. And the moon really um, is roughly 432 million um, centimetres um, um, was, yeah, uh, closer back then, 8,000, 85,000 years ago. Mm. So it's, could you imagine that? It's 432 million centimetres closer. So the moon has moved further away in that time. Um, you've got 70 million years ago, if you think about it, it's a little bit. It's like interesting because you look at physics, you could really start to understand a little bit more about things, like the density of the sun only being you know, 0.7, the, the density of water, for instance. Uh, yeah. um, but, um, and 7%, the density of water is what um, Saturn is because it's mainly like a watery body gaseous. And so 90 million years ago really ends a major extinction with a major extinction event. And it's really a time span that you could look and see the duck-billed platypus wandering around everywhere and flying reptiles and this sort of thing. And you've got chicks on the club asteroid pretty much at a similar time and following along with 66,000 years ago, roughly. Uh, what happens now, really, is, um, you know, for our ancestors ever more known... And like the KT eliminated 80% most of all life um, and such certain it did, you know, it's asteroids and the things that went on back then. But carbon-14 shows, of course, which could be accurate if it's a little bit this data where a lot of other things is you can start to correlate things more um, and that you could, you could use, you know, to look at life a little bit but it only can go back a little way. Um, but it shows 22,000 years ago, 39... 39,000 years ago, you've got different sorts of events which goes on in the data. And dinosaur bones, of course, um, have been found um, only that old. And um, so it's all of them, so a lot of things. And so, so how come all of a sudden you see no? Um, the data uh, sh doesn't show that this is millions of years old. That's ridiculous. And no fossil evidence really of any evolution um, shows that evolution occurred and no fossil ever fits with any, any category, of course. But if you don't really have anything in between any transition, and that there's no, and there is symbiosis and pleomorphism, which you could learn about, you could see how easy it is for all the species to arrive as they have, which in life, life uh, colloid and colloidal bowels and secrets of an alkaline body, people could start to learn a bit more about this and jumps magnicity, which some of this stuff would, would release a little bit more. But it's no direct ancestor, of course, for man or dinosaur, and it really makes sense that dinosaurs really didn't live out at the same time. Um, they sure did. Um, they lived at the same time, in more recent times even, and, also, and rather than um, millions of years ago, only thousands, and dogs and cats and rabbits all lived where dinosaurs were. So you've got, in, you've got vertebrates and you've got the land, and invertebrates. And invertebrates, you've got to go only back 350,000 years ago. That's, that's, that's not millions. Um, and so this, this really, the dating thing is a problem because and maybe we just have a moment to talk just a little bit about that um, because it's totally, completely not, not scientific like we said. Um, but it, the dating always was because something was, can't accept that any calamity occurred. Why? Well, because that accelerates all the uh, uh, decay rate radically. And can you accept that something would all of a sudden not be uh, consistent in the model that exists? No. And so, see, this is very problematic. But the Buccal asteroid, like we talked about, flooded over the northern area of the whole of Africa and mountains caused mountains of tsunami and the Gulf of Oman and all of this gets funneled and swept across the Sahara like we talked about. And the telltale sign of evidence, really, which in the original Trans-Saharan Sea um, used to be and that would be in the more the middle of Africa. Um, and it was the ports and things and ocean. But um, 28,000 years ago, you've got core samples which show, you know, it was massive sea flooding in there. Um, um, and so various times you see the landscape has changed from what you're looking at. A catastrophic flood recent time, of course, also because of the, the uh, rivers and things just like this, explains how... Um, deposits come to be more in the Black Sea, for instance, and how that came to be with um, salt within it, and it used to be rainwater, um, and now it's a build-up of of uh, static mines, static tight in the caves, 
which if you go underground and it just you could see when did this all occur like a massive increase suddenly in water precipitation you could see all of those things you can add it all up like a computer you could start to actually be way more than some computer could be but a massive increase in rainfall also is a really increase in solar flare activity and, and comets and this sort of thing. And expanding really the shorelines of the Black Sea, it's all real proof that some, some, there was an existence of Neolithic uh, settlements more um, in the day and factual of absolute inspected and all seen significant. You've got wood from ancient villages all around the bottom where the Black Sea was and there's no question that the flood did wipe out all of that and that, um, you know, uh, back then um, it, um, it was um, before the founding of Crete. And so you've got the more Kush Atlantean Empire going back and um, suddenly starting to mine again big time in um, Canaan and Canada, which, um, yeah, uh, it, Canada is much older than Canaan. Um, you know, and the mining and all that, that sort of thing, and the ports and stuff are radical. So, um, you know, but Atlantean and the Phoenicians, of course, that we're talking about really settled and they went right across um, the um, Silk Road um, and the, all their buildings and things and style of this, which is obvious and can still be seen to this day. But settlements really go back in a very sophisticated way beyond Crete and the long, definite the Mediterranean and very large, fresh, Water lakes, which which was at the bottom of the Black Sea, which was today, of course. I mean, and you've got metallic sorts of objects, which really show great sophistication. Of course, six thousand five hundred years ago, you've got really old European science. Of course, that comes along in more C dimension and geometry, and then you've got five to three, and you've got all these sort of advanced types of um, ways to get pi, and extreme sophistication, and you've got you know. Um, this didn't just come out of a vacuum, you see. You've really um, got evidence of a young Earth um, and knowledge migrating to begin again and disperse where knowledge is. And, um, of course, Canaan and Canada and uh, the Greek and all the languages that's very similar, like there with the, the native originals in Canada. Um, and when the flood came, of course, it had emptied the Mediterranean out back then and it all rushed back in like a... A, uh, giant, a giant uh, rapid sort of thing. Salt evaporates in times before this. You could see decades before this um, and all the water has evaporated and causes massive big huge salt deposits which uh, below the Mediterranean is one of the more older sea floor levels like Lake Victoria is. I mean then soft tissue that's recovered from the fire bone of T-Rex in Montana. You've got... Uh, really, uh, you know, showing you amongst, in our mind, amongst some of the older sort of things which is going on, like the sea floor where we're talking about, it's only really um, not very old at all, um, and more in the thousands, not millions, like people think. Um, and now that figures in, can fit perfectly um, to, to show you, of course, what went on and where, this, how did the South Pole come to be where it is. But tissue um, and blood and collagen really still and preserved, um, which is common, could be found inside fossils. Um, and so how could that be if that was so old? It can't be. Of course, tissue in cells break down really quickly and couldn't ordinarily be older than maybe 4,000 years old, perhaps, you know. But you'd wonder, wouldn't you? But um, if ages really are a bit of a disgrace on us because um, you don't really can get the same age from the same lab ever and also a massive uh, anomalies and things and in sedimentary layering and this sort of thing but if you go back you could see certain that the Burkle crater did fl flood did occur um, and that was like um, you know, 4,800 years ago roughly but it, the, dis the, the decay rates of uh, the con and granite for instance that dates and try to get the date of the earth and things shows very old zircon that's inherited and arbitrarily kind of escaped and not have anybody known of any start point because there was no observational reference point for anybody to look to see what was inside something. And so a parent and a daughter could be present inside the first start sample of something that began because who would know? And so you can't, can't take all that extrapolatedness and cause, cause uh, confounding uh, variables to exist. It's not controlled 
and say that you've really come up with a date or something which is just so off, it's unbelievable, it's so wrong, we should scrap it. Um, radioactivity really that would get, end up going to lead, for instance, but doesn't do that in any consistentness. An enormous diversity is the result of, and so if you've got four hour glasses and you've got all these different ways that to create the time, like uranium, iridium, and potassium argon, and uh, and um, strontium and and argon, and these sorts of decay rates and all sort of really don't are not uh, consistent whatsoever. And so um, we're looking at flood geography and these sorts of things. There are so many things that you could describe and actually that you could point out and start to look at that actually start to date things more accurately but carbon dating can often have been violated because you've got these two irrational sort of assumptions because potassium argon decay um, and the and the account of whatever it's known um, and the improvable all sorts of assumptions that could have existed um, and um, you've got um, uh, you know soft tissue where dinosaurs are you've got um, how could this be millions of years old You've got um, 8 billion um, skeletons that are supposed to be of humans, apparent um, hominoids, if it was that we just sort of began about a hundred and uh, about a million um, uh, years, uh, um, 185,000 years ago, and there might have been a million of us. Um, it really would then end up with like, apparently got 8 billion skeletons somewhere, where there's all that. But it's really. Um, unproven assumption and that's really wrong. Tragedy really is a finite fallen assumption of course that's rejected um, and that proper science as authority really should be because otherwise you've really got a tragedy haven't you and how could we accept all this but from Genesis and these sorts of things where um, things um, certainly in science and um, what apparently science is that certainly doesn't add up but the scientific method really could be unproven, unproven assumptions and the carbon dating is reasonable up to only 50,000 years. Carbon-12 is consistent over many years and it's, it's a half-life certain too. But then carbon-14 does and the radio and the ratio between the two has completely changed because we're burning a lot and we're making more carbon-12 than we ever would have um, just natural and so you've got a larger ratio of carbon-12 to carbon-14 so these are things which is not really constant and then in decay and C12 has a sewage effect like this, the burned fossil fuels and C12 and same in a different sort of ratio of uh, or not any C14 in relationship which would be ordinary and natural but that's we've got to change those things so rock tests of parent to know what the parent or daughter um, decay rate, which is something constant. How could you know? Because you wouldn't have been there to be able to point out what was in the beginning and how did something start. And so the, the time of decay um, that's present really isn't known and no observation much is a reference point that exists. You've got a lot of confounding consumptions really. So no observational reference point, no daughter and Parent atoms could ever be understood and looked at. No decay rate really could be very constant at all. And and so, because of these things, there's a lot of things which has been falsified. And shouldn't that be known? I mean, if um, you've got all these things sort of going on, of course, um, and shouldn't those sorts of things be questioned? Because otherwise, you've got a real conspiracy of a bit of silence. And you've got certain it is true isotope decay and radiometric sorts of conditions a scientific method of dating the earth which is completely off and make me sick and like how could it keep going on with somebody says yeah 4.5 bill 4.5 point bill it's like you want to get just have a technicolor yawn because it's so bad and um but could somebody be a bit more logical and the layering of the corresponding to 10,000 years that apparently is truly ridiculous. Let's just get rid of Darwin right now. That was really bad. Um, and also Pasteur, they both lied like crazy. You know what I mean? And then something else was going on back then that influencing everything a little bit dissimilar like today. Um, you've got a clandestine picture, of course, where you're looking at seeing discoveredness of events and even like on a wander and knowing that everything was connected and you've got Aboriginal paintings all over the earth at the time in the same time frame and suddenly all of a sudden you know, continents would get more moved apart but fault movements could sink and also rise and you've got fresh water and you've got um, 
slowly becoming selenated and you've got fresh tissue inside dinosaur bones which start to show up, can't be 65 million years ago. You've got um, um, fossilised finger bones and this sort of thing that's found with, with um, dinosaur bones in the Pluxy River region and things similar, agedness and so apparent. A fossil handprint also found in Glen, Glen Rose and you've got the largest dragonfly flying back then which has got a, a wingspan of about 30 inches and um, it would uh, weigh as much as sort of like a, uh, you know, a pound or more. Um, large, large bugs roamed around. You've got earth crew in a disciplinary manner with no subduction, no plate shifting, no rotation, no tectonic plates. They really fit perfectly together into a smaller planet that's 12 times smaller than it is today. Absolutely perfect and all over it all fits and it's nailed. And in recent time, you've got the duck-billed platypus that did roam everywhere. And you've got aboriginals ripping around too. And you've got the older sea floor at the bottom, and it's only about 125,000 more years old and not old. Just the oldest dating of the sea floor really is showing us that um, the oceans are really fairly new, not old. So you've got this mega tsunami where the Burkle Crater is recently, of course, associated with with all these um, uh, water that's swarmed over the whole of Australia and other places too. You've got the deluge, which you could see right there. If you look from afar down at the earth, you can see how that's affected America. Um, the deluge vaporised uh, massive amounts of water when it happened, and it coincides with you know, at least 155 different types of current cultural stories, doesn't it? You've got deep sea sands all placed over the lands and you've got deep sea microflora all at the top of the mountains. You've got nothing that survived except for just bit. And you've got chevrons that show you how did that happen? So couldn't we just grow up and get on with everything? You've got a massive deposits all over the islands um, and um, you've got an impact of chevericals which are found and so you've got um, singular events which went on and it's all said that um, around 4,800 years ago you've got 180 metre high waves which, which originate more um, from points which you could see um, and um, you could see where all this has come straight out of where the chevron, um, chevrons are and go back from where this is and you can go right back to the Burkle crater. Um, and so old stories, which really around 5,000 years ago, of course, um, Noah's Ark, of course, and Noah's Flood, um, and you've got uh, a lot of this sort of really civility all of a sudden that happened, suddenly thrown out the window, window, and you've got a brutal type of an existedness of some smashed type of condition. Um, but you've got um, um, water that just moves over India during the same time, and a huge tsunami which then deposits all the uh, salt and things in the Himalayas. You've got comets which really are shown to break up and break up into little pieces and things. And some of that sort of ends up in the, in the uh, Indian Ocean. Um, and you've got around um, 2807 BC, um, you've got this flood from the Burkle um, crater and all died more or less, you know, quite a bit. You've got ocean water that was vol volatilized and winds and that spread vapor all around the world. Um, and you've got such severe magnetic storms going on where everything is sort of decimated, but evidence of it. But the dating of the Earth, which really could be seen that the sea floor expansion is where the tectonic plates are pushed apart from each other. And every event where an asteroid was, it boils and heats up the mantle suddenly, of course, and all becoming plastic and continents start to get pushed apart by the water that's locked up in the Earth. And 90, uh, only, uh, uh, less than 1% of all the water that exists is flowing at the moment a bit more than 99% still in the earth, locked up in the rock, but where, where uh, you've got um, uh, these huge uh, events that go on, continents are pushed apart because water starts to boil and things and start to heat and they can span 1,700% of what it is, which is normal. Um, and um, so ocean floors start to spread and um, water comes out of the rocks and this all starts around 85 
thousand years ago more lake victoria and the mediterranean and the hugging of the pacific plate you could see the oldest lakes more and bottom of the sea floors and all of this is more like under the mediterranean is in a very old spot and um you've got um these oceans are really fairly new and the acceleration of time that subsides more um where something is relative to each other today where continents are left um, but for instance 15 million years ago of course only a short mile time a massive um spread was sudden and um you got 200 millimeters per year all of a sudden in one moment and so you see how could this occur if, if there wasn't actually some explanation for that because the density hasn't changed but the expansion has occurred um and if that expansion is massive um and now you're going to have three quarters more gravity um because we've moved we've moved the surface a larger larger surface away from the center simple and we've increased increased the gravity uh, as a result so we had much much less gravity back then so of course when you could really look at this um you could go back 15 million years they got asteroids which are ripping through the Indian Ocean skipping and and ripping out just above Java and plunging back into the Pacific um you've got an age of uh, progressiveness um which where where the older um you know sea floors are are moved away more from the mid ocean ridge expansion joint um and so you've got uh, expansion joints which is typical which is about 0.7 cm or Point zero four of an inch per year, but suddenly it could go up to seventeen centimeters, which is about six point seven inches per year. And imagine the massive increase that's going on where that is. But how could it be so sudden? All of a sudden, you see, if it wasn't that occurred, and you can also see that suddenly you've got a lot of water that comes out of the earth, and it's increasing the sea floor spread, and causes more of the um, levels of the ocean to rise. And so this is the reason for all this like what we're talking about um and um the climate changes are just making a pretty penny of a lot of stuff but otherwise bankers are not going to be interested in um um in um people investing in properties close to the coastline if all this is what said is oh wow guess what you're going to be um flooded out it's like wow i mean um, a lot of this is completely totally incorrect utterly I mean, we're going to be coming into an ice age soon. So, what do you think? The poles are going to just freeze all of a sudden more, and when all the water went up there because of uh, you know um, drastic events that pushed all the water up there, and it just left it up there. And it's still, so, but thermal expansion and density, a JC quanta is critical for water to be in a liquid state, and it's a very temperature dependent, of course, because at 42 degrees or 4 degrees Celsius or 42 degrees Fahrenheit, you've got the highest um you know condition going on of a loading point and above and below that water um expands and so it's not as dense and so um water has one of the highest melting points of course as an anomaly you've got a very high critical point and surface tension bounce and you've got viscosity and heat uh in its vaporization which is really some very anomalous types of conditions and things if you think about it but it's expanding and going beyond its critical state where things are um and held and locked up in the water it can become suddenly uh, much less dense and of course when it's in expanded state it's extremely um got interesting properties and far level far more a uh, level of different sorts of properties that exist for it since when you look into water that's inside a crystal and and it's got different properties it can't freeze for instance it really can expand up to 9% or more of its volume where water is general and mass weight could have um, not is unchanged of course but 1 degree celsius um you've got a 0.00021 sort of water increase in its volume and that steam of course it could be 1700 times more expanded yes <laughs> and so now okay. you can see the reason why the earth is expanded like it has 
the dating of the Earth really could be seen more from the seafloor expansion, like we're talking about, where the tectonic plates more are pushed apart from each other. You can see the events where asteroid impact really boiled and heated up the mantle, and suddenly all being more plastic, the continents all more pushed apart. You've got um, because of the water which was locked up in the Earth, and suddenly all of a sudden that's just released more. And this is what you see going on and flowing more where the oceans have come to be more. And so you've got an Earth that's 12 times larger than it really was, and this explains it. This jumps, uh, not a theory, but a uh, grand unified totality of the way the Earth um, grew. It's gut. It's a grand unified totality. It's not a theory. Of course, the, the ocean floor spread only starts around, you know, uh, some small time ago. This is not a long time ago at all. Um, you've got Lake Victoria, you've got the Mediterranean, you've got the hugging of the Pacific Plate. Um, and as we said, uh, look, there's massive uh, problems with dating rocks. Jesus, I mean, it's, it's a shocker, okay? Um, there's no, no consistency, so we've got, to, we've got to drop it. You've got to come up with a better way to go looking at things. And you can't keep going on with this 10,000 year stuff and your layering thing to come up with all these old, old dates, which how the hell can you go back? You can't. This is too much of a, a gap in everything, and it's purposeful, honest, um, but not quite not right. It's just like most people don't even know how blood is formed. But also under the Mediterranean, you can really see a great divi oldness and a, a divided sort of a floor and the spread of where things are and the patterns of time and things of how accumulation of, of material that's existing there comes to be, and you can explain how that happened. Very good. Because now you're like looking at an hourglass, you're learning a little bit more how to read everything. But if it's in an instance more of some thousands or millions of years ago, you've got certain that at 15 million years ago more, you've suddenly all of a sudden got a massive, massive spread. And it's over 200 millimetres or more a year. Um, and so you've got something that all of a sudden gets kicked off, don't you? You see? And so um, um, you've got things which definitely show a younger Earth in the thousands of years old, not millions even. And uh, it, we, um, it's just that the age is gross, grotesquely sort of um, not correct and that the older that you go on, where something is where ages, you could see that it's certain that the older parts of the um, are much older than the mid-ocean section where the ridge is expanding, where the joint is, you see. And so the oldest parts are at the closest to where the continents are, um, and that is where you're finding the old seafloor. So as you can see, that uh, the seafloor is only pushed apart by five miles of uh, basalt and the rest of the continents are like up to 37 miles or so of something sick and so you can see how the earth has expanded because you've got that five mile more or less of basalt pushing 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 the continents apart and 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 vaporizedness of water and all sorts of things causing an equilibrium relative to the turga that's existed and as the earth spins it pushes out more at the equator and brings and subducts more at the poles. And when the Earth sort of changed its uh, north-south, always it also changed, of course, the equator too. And these things all can be seen so perfectly honest in the way that um, north-south has crystallized in the, uh, in, the, in the magma. If you can learn how to read these things, you come up with something which is, is close to what I can see from what I've done in my investigation of reading the tissue in some of the topics which we've just talked about. Anyway, mate, I hope you're having a really wonderful day as you get this, and I really feel like um, maybe there's a question or two. <laughs> Rick from Chicago was asking about the osmolytic enzymes. I think it was. Okay. Um, osmolytic enzyme... Um, um, you know, an enzyme, of course, has to be remained relative in its osmolytic state because um, it can't have been congealed or coagulated or uh, become resistant um, because um, it, um, uh, you know, uh, it has to be still a functional. And then most of these things uh, don't remain functional. Um, they're no longer in an enzymatic state at all. 
Um, so everything that which, which is um, enzymatic, meaning that it's still in its um, got an orthophilic state, um, lots of things are not. And so where are you going to get those enzymes from to help break things down? But um, it's typical that this is sort of a law of adaptive secretion of digestive enzyme. And if you bring some enzyme in with food, is it's going to help it's going to help to digest that food. If you don't do that, you're always robbing something from the body, aren't you? And so you're eventually ending up with pancreatic deficiency. But if you could think that that's gone on where somebody is genetic and things, um, would you absolutely need actually more um, enzymes to come into the body to help where this is? And where should they come from? Um, should they be really good enzymes or cold processed and this sort of thing? Or should it be mixed up with a lot of plant protein? Um, and all sorts of things which is glassified um, and really sort of a bit more um, uh, uh, excitotoxic and stuff. But um, we're on track a little bit when you're kind of thinking about enzymes. Yes, you're thinking about more um, osmolytic element. And that enzymes are so important, especially like a pathway that actually involves this sulfur dioxygenase pathway, which is one of the more powerful pathways. If you're thinking about a computing and you're thinking about actually uh, looking at all the evidence, everything on the earth and it's just coming up with what the most powerful sort of um, uh, you know, antioxidants of this sort of thing is, you're going to come up with this sulfur dioxygenase pathway, yeah? And get on with it when you can because you're going to give things a rating and now you've got substance which can help detox people from nervine and this sort of thing. And the reason why some of these substances like $44,000 a kilo of honey, um, the reason is because you can absolutely got substances in that can help turn people people's conditions around so it can be po that were poisoned and things, you see, yeah? Because it's got such powerful enzymes in it. Can you heal yourself up without this pathway? No, absolutely not. Number one condition of the massive concentration of element that we have in our product, which I, uh, you know, cold process and um, and craft basically, yeah. There's no more concentration of these things really about not on the earth. But that's what another question is, mate. This one's kind of personal. Schizophrenia? Yeah, um, it really is um, a big difference between and so solid a connectedness that an ordinary person of some kind could have some schizophrenic sorts of behaviors a bit, but not be schizophrenic because it's not something which continues on past the point where some disturbedness is where thought is and logic and things and isn't quite as easy able to be put per se. I mean, that. Um, a condition exists where the amygdala and tegmentum complex, which is involving aversion, inhibition, and dissociation, a more internal processedness of Malu, is far larger and more operating than the septal region of the brain, which is involved more in pleasure and interest, which connects you to your frontal cortex. So your frontal cortex really causes you to have the ease of ability to have a faculty to inspire creative influence of the future and the motor sequencing of behavior and this sort of thing and more an alpha gating reflex in this. Um, and so you've really got uh, right and left hemisphere crossed over sort of thing going on where you've got more frontal cortex activity um, and you only get into that if you've got pleasure and interest but what would happen if you just grew up and you really had just a lot of dearth and everything was I don't want can't should try but master only and very adverse and you grew your amygdala system so big um, and the tegmentum, and every time anything ever goes on, you're tripped up so quick and fast. I mean, most of these people are sweating by their hands, uh, they're cold, they're clammy, uh, they don't have really much energy, they daydream a lot, they can't be too functional in life, they polarize very, very quick, they get set off, and afterward they can't collect themselves. It's like all of a sudden sort of something happened. It's like they're, they're packing themselves up in the they've headed off or something and they can't connect with anyone. It's like they're doing things and they're not really connecting with someone, you see? And these things are very, very trouble, troublesome for someone behaviorally where they are um, because they always a pancreatic function. It's not known that they have cystic fibrosis and this cystic fibrosis causing dark circles around their eyes, causing their skin to be dry, causing their hair to fall out, causing them to have sort of more deer-eyed types of condition where um, their eyes are sort of bulged slightly a little more um, and um, causing dry skin, 
uh, causing uh, you know, cold hands um, and uh, causing sleep disturbance, um, causing sleep onset latency disturbance um, and uh, um, not thriving and uh, uh, having a lot of don't want can't should type but must only and having fear way more than you should and doing a lot of mind reading, thinking people thought something, which how could you think that this is ridiculous? Um, you know, um, there's too many things that's just a, a, a violation that uh, the pancreas has primarily got lesions and, and there's intestinal lesions and those things can cause someone not to have minded the gut so they could gut the mind. When you gut the mind, you've minded the gut, but how can you mind the gut? If you don't mind the gut, you can't gut the mind because minding the gut is making sure that you have a serotonin dopamine axis good. And most people's serotonin dopamine axis is really off because they're not making proper neurotransmitters. And so it's sort of really not recognized. But behavioral things you can see, um, these are people who have control issues big and they've never really learned how to motivate people. And so they're so stuck in the control issue one, like they will dissociate, walk off, um, they'll pack themselves up and take off and they just really um, can withdraw all their service so fast and quick. You will see this often. Um, you'll see them turned on and then all of a sudden turned off. And, and so they'll think that other people are turned off and suddenly turned off. And this, this, on, and this this is ridiculous. This can't be existed. But this is sort of like the world that somebody sees, and that's their world. And their world internal is the same as the world outside. And how bad is that? The world inside doesn't match what is on the outside proper for them to actually achieve anything. And so uh, most of it is they cannot turn the internal dialogue off. And they're doing all these other types of things to practice austerity or who's to know something, which is truly disastrous. Because the thing that you'll be doing is actually feeling pleasantry and bliss from having turned their mind off and being able to function ever more proper. Um, and uh, so little known is it that the pancreas coming full circle more is so important and uh, cystic fibrosis, somebody should look more into this, Jump cell rejuvenation helps heal this up. And so um, might you look a little bit more by going to jumpdavid.com and having a little bit of a look into jump cell rejuvenation. And um, if we know our past, it's pretty spiritual, isn't it? Because we could know more where we're going, isn't it? Yes? Yes, we can. But we must know that because you've got this referential index, haven't you? And now you can be more scientific about what you're saying and doing. Um, and you can be more qualitative in how you go about doing things, which most scientists have never studied qualitative research. They don't even know what validity is or reliability. They can't define any of these things, so that's pretty bad, you know what I mean? But it's okay too. I mean, we should just learn how to wake up, really, all of us. Yeah. Um, anything else, mate? Thank you um, for you've been going over some of this stuff me for years I appreciate you going back over it for me exactly mate how amazing got a good show got in a nutshell some few things which are a bit paradigm busting um, but stay tuned for the next show we've got some really great stuff and positive sure um, good questions today um, let's keep going with some of this stuff here anyway maybe some bit more shows that relate to this eh? and things that relate to it anyway um, administrative councils can form all over the earth which they should and and we could be forming policy versus policy being formed to cause us to be just dumbed down and stuff anyway mate hope you have a really great day to get this and um, we'll catch up to each other in a future show mate yeah Thanks. love you mate love you and too. love to our audience love you mate.